while, those that we have been seeing, visitors today, and also those we're seeing for the first time. Little baby Rowan is here with us, uh, so it's exciting, so exciting to see all of you here. So glad that you're with us this morning for this worship service. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure was released in February 1989, 32 years ago. I didn't like it then, and I don't like it now. They've actually re released two sequels, one that just came out last year. I guess they had to finish up the story. But I thought it was a good way to bring about my lesson this morning, even though I don't particularly care for the movie, even though I am the target demographic. I'm supposed to like this movie, but for some reason I don't. I guess I prefer Back to the Future in my time travel movies. But for this movie, it does help to introduce the lesson, How to Be an Excellent Christian. That's what we want to be, isn't it? We don't want to be a failing Christian. We don't want to be a Christian that, that God's not proud of. We don't want to be a Christian that people look at and say, are we sure that he or she is a Christian? I'm not sure. Well, let's look at the book of Philippians, please. Philippians chapter 4 is where we will be this morning. Philippians 4, verses 1 through 5. Feel free to, to keep your bookmark there. We'll be referencing this passage several times this morning. Philippians is known as one of the prison epistles written by Paul, and that will be very important as we look at what he's trying to convey to the church at Philippi. There's three other uh, prison epistles, the, book, uh, the letter to the Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. These are his other prison epistles. And when you know where someone is writing from, it can really add more weight, more substance to what the writer is trying to convey. Paul very well may have been fettered and shackled to a series of Roman guards, but the word that he preached and wrote here remained unfettered and free, one commentator put it. This letter to the Philippians is full of joy and thankfulness, and Paul wrote to encourage his fellow servants living in Philippi, to encourage them to have them to learn and understand what joy is, is why he wrote to the church at Philippi. Jailed, imprisoned, not free to go. Hey, church at Philippi, let me encourage you. Let me teach you about joy. Joy in all circumstances. Even suffering. Joy in serving, chapter 2. Joy in faith, chapter 3. And joy in giving, chapter 4, which is where we are this morning. If Paul can write about joy from a Roman prison, then there's something I can learn from his letter today. As we consider his writings, let's look to Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, he says. Again, I will say rejoice. I'm sure the church at Philippi was thinking, rejoice, Paul. You're writing about rejoicing in a prison? You know, that was a great testament to his faith and about his perspective on life, because while he was chained, while he couldn't come and go as he pleased, who was he ministering to? The Roman guards. He was talking to them. He was talking to the other prisoners. Hey, you want to know about Jesus? Let me tell you about him. And he was rejoicing because that was his goal in life, was to bring others to Christ. And when you change your perspective, you can see where some of this joy comes from. Verse 5, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Now we're going to be taking this passage apart bit by bit and seeing what we can learn. Because sometimes, you know, you read a passage and you take the larger picture. But then if you can take a magnifying glass and really look down into it, you can gain a lot of lessons, a lot of teachings from it. That's what we're going to do this morning. Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, let's, let's read it again. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved, he says in verse 1. God created us, 
Christ died for us, and the Holy Spirit works through us in conjunction with the Word of God. Well, what do some people do in light of this? To be an excellent Christian, Paul says, stand firm in the Lord. That's what we must do. We must consider our Creator, our Savior, the Holy Spirit. We must consider them and act in a certain way. But some people, they don't study. They don't research the Word of God. They, they, don't, they don't read for, for, for pleasure the Word of God. They, they just kind of take what they're given. They don't study. And what are they standing firm in? Perhaps the words of someone else. I don't know. But as you face eternity, this is a good thing to do. To be able to stand firm in the Lord. As your eternal soul will be somewhere, someplace, someday. As you consider that, knowing where you stand is an important factor to consider. And Paul says to the Philippian congregation, if you want to be an excellent Christian, then stand firm in the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2 says this, The things which you have heard from me, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. If we're going to stand firm in the Lord, we've got to teach others. We've got to teach our children. We've got to teach our family, our, our friends who, who may be interested in things like this. And, and sometimes you've got to ask yourself, who can I talk to about some spiritual things right now and help them see where I stand? Jesus told his apostles to teach others. The Word of God is your pattern, our pattern for everything how the family should be constructed, how to be effective, men and women, how the church should operate, and also, of course, salvation. It must be taught, and it must be where we stand. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 57. In this passage, Paul describes how important the imperishable spirit is and how through it we can overcome death. There are going to be things on this planet that will perish, but there are things that are imperishable. And in verse 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. It takes work. It requires us to toil, to stand firm in the Lord. Sometimes people are too easily pushed over, too easily swayed, by certain things, because they're not standing on the solid rock. They're not standing firm in the Lord. And here Paul is, is imploring the people, be steadfast, be immovable, abound in the work of the Lord. Don't, don't just do it a little bit, but abound in it. You'll be blessed, and you'll see that your toil, your work, it is not in vain. He says in 2 Peter chapter 3, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're not standing firm in the Lord, you'll be taken away by anything. You'll be taken away and you'll, you'll follow a, a teaching, you'll follow something that's not based in the Word of God, but rather based on someone's opinion, based on a larger group's opinion, what have you. But Paul is imploring us to stand firm in the Lord. That is one way to be an excellent Christian. Next, in verse 2 of Philippians chapter 4, Paul mentions two people. And well, this is a letter. So Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is writing. He says, I know there's two people, basically he says this, I know there's, there's two people with a conflict in the congregation there. And he says, I urge Yodiah and I urge Sintyke to live in harmony in the Lord. Yodiah and Sintyke weren't getting along. We don't know what the issue was, but we know there's a conflict. And one of the more famous conflicts in the New Testament is found in Acts chapter 15, Verses 36 through 40. This is between Paul and Barnabas. Paul, the man who wrote through the Holy Spirit much of the New Testament, and Barnabas we often refer to as the encourager. These two mountainous Christian men couldn't get along about something. And as Paul is writing these words, I wonder if he's thinking about this conflict that he had with Barnabas 
before he was jailed. In Acts chapter 15, Paul wanted to go visit the congregations they had worked with. We had Brother Dale Byram here a few weeks ago. We often have several of our missionaries who will come report on the work. You know, we work with them, we support them. You know, Paul's wanting to go and visit with the congregations that he has established. But Barnabas wanted to take John Mark along, but Paul didn't. Because he had deserted them. John Mark had deserted them at some point. Well, because of this conflict, Paul and Barnabas stopped working together. And as far as we know, anyway, they never rejoined. Unity is important. But serious conflicts cannot be ignored either. There's a few things to consider as we look at Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 40. The disagreement itself was not on doctrine. That's a good thing but rather on how to handle the Lord's work. Barnabas being the encourager, look, Paul, John Mark needs this. He need, he, I know he left us, but if we just take him along, you know, we just take him along. Paul, Paul's like, no, he, we can't depend on him. You know, in, in organizations, in schools, you know, a lot of times you find people like this. Let, let's give the child one more chance. You know, sure, he tried to set fire to whatever, but, you know, let's just give him one more chance, okay? I can hear Barnabas saying that. He's the encourager. Paul, being the, the militant man that he was, says, no, Barnabas, we're not going to do it. So they disagreed on how to handle the Lord's work. We know they loved each other. We know they disagreed, but they split up. Sometimes this happens. The verse in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, it does not say live together in harmony in the Lord. It says live in harmony in the Lord. Sometimes harmony may mean apart, like here with Paul and Barnabas. And it's interesting to note, just as when the New Testament Christians were first cast out, that was how the gospel was spread. But because they went their separate ways, perhaps more good was done. And it is truly amazing what God can do with us, even in our most difficult of circumstances. This lesson on conflict is huge. Take this lesson as you will and apply it to your life. To live in harmony, we know that's important, if at all possible. Next, he says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3, Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. So Paul is asking, help these women. Not sure which women he's referring to, but being in prison, we know here that Paul, he needed help. He needed help, and the church had sent gifts to Paul, sent them uh, with Epaphroditus a leader in the Philippian church who ended up assisting Paul with ministry in Rome, and Epaphroditus actually delivers the letter back to the Philippian congregation. That's how they transferred things in those days. But to be an excellent Christian, one must seek assistance. Help is often difficult for people to ask for or accept sometimes. We value independence in our society, and asking for help, some believe, is a sign of weakness. But I believe it to be rather a sign of spiritual maturity for many in the New Testament. Many champions of men and women ask for assistance. Ask for help before you fall spiritually. Ask for help before you fall in other ways. Because through your fall, the change can actually ripple through your family, can actually ripple through a congregation. And it can be difficult on us all. And where we oftentimes find ourselves, those that, that cared for the person who fell, who, who went the wrong way, who made some bad decisions, will often look at each other and say, man, if I'd only known. If I'd only known before this happened or that's happened. Because sometimes as, as people need help, you know, they're, they're, they're rolling down a hill and you can't catch them. They're moving so fast. With the people I work with in counseling, they're moving so fast away from each other, away from me, I can't grab them. Seek help before it's too late. Ecclesiastes 4 says this, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Our society has been built on people helping others. Think of where you are now. Are you in a place in your life
because you did it all on your own? Or did someone help you and encourage you along the way? As I consider the work here at the congregation, you know and I know one person can't do it all. We need each other. People today need community. This is one of the things that our society is, is losing more and more of, it seems, is a sense of community. So people look for it. They seek it out wherever they go, and they, they find it in the wrong places. great place to find community is with the congregation of the Lord's church. Because you're going to have community here on this earth, and you're going to have community for eternity in heaven as well. So seek assistance. We all need help. Moses, in Exodus chapter 17 Verses 8 through 14, he needed help. The story here, the Israelites were fighting the Amalekites. And the Israelites were winning as long as Moses held his staff, held his arms above his head. As long as he was doing that, a miracle would occur, and God would allow the Israelites to prevail. But, you know, how long can you do this? Hold your arms up above your head. Not very long at all. Seems easy. But hold them there for a little bit. They'll start to get heavy. And a battle lasts a pretty long time. So Moses couldn't do it on his own. Hold his arms up. Exodus 17, 12. But Moses' hands were heavy. My hands not heavy. Here they are. Well, it's different when you're holding them up, right? Then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. And the Israelites prevailed. Your help is needed here because you have talents that can be used. We are a body of believers, and helping is what we should be about, helping one another out through whatever, whatever we might be facing. And Paul in Philippians 4 actually mentions how Clement even had been a part of their work as well. So seek assistance. You'll be an excellent Christian. Next, we should reflect. Paul does this very, very quickly in this passage. In Philippians chapter 4, he says, The women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. He's reflecting on what they had done with him and for him. They struggled with him in furthering the gospel of Christ. As we consider our Christian lives, we often talk about moving forward. We look to the horizon. We trust that God is there for us now and in the future. Philippians 3 and verse 13 and 14 actually says... Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. We often reference this verse. Others like it to show that we should be moving forward, not looking behind, because that's where sin is, right? Our sin's in the past. Our old selves are in the past. Job said in chapter 17 and verse 9, Nevertheless, the righteous will hold to his way. The righteous will keep moving forward, and he who has clean hands will grow stronger and stronger. But Paul here essentially is saying, reflect on the struggles that you've had. Reflect on what you have done. So how can looking backward help us? We reflect, number one, on past victories. By looking back, we can make sure that we're on the right path. So we're in regards to victories, where has God helped you? Where were you struggling? Paul mentions the struggle. Where were you struggling and what came of it? What did you learn? What victories were there? How did it make you stronger? Whenever you look on the right path and see the bumps in the road and see that you opened to the book of Philippians or that you opened to the book of Proverbs and you read something or someone said something to you that day, looking back saying, that person made a difference in my life and because of that I'm here today. And when we reflect, we can really see God working and moving in our lives in a way that, if we, looking back, would not have, we would have never noticed it had we not looked back and thought about it. Psalm chapter 77 and verse 11 says, I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. We must reflect and see where we've been. And know that our faith in God is truly working. Next, to be an excellent Christian, remember your goal. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5. 
no, that's not right. Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 3, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. That's where we want to be, isn't it? We want our names to be in the book of life. Is your name in the book of life? Are you a Christian? Are you a faithful Christian? Are you serving Him or were you drug here? Are you here out of mere obligation? Or are you here seeking a spiritual relationship with your Heavenly Father? And you know that your name is in the book of life. That's one of the questions we're going to answer tonight. How do I know I'm saved? I hope you'll be here for that. Revelation 3 and verse 5 says, He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. I want my name to be written there so that my Heavenly Father, so that my Savior will go before our Heavenly Father and say, Del Sadler's name is in the book of life, and I want your name to be there too. But we've got to remember this is what we're striving for. We'd rather have, it seems, more followers on our social media. We consider that more often, it seems, than we do whether or not our name is in the book of life. Think about what your goals are. What are they? What are our goals here as a congregation? What should we be about in our daily lives? To make money? To be entertained? to be comfortable. Ultimately, we know that these aren't our greatest goals, but when we don't get them, when they're interrupted, we become frustrated. And this creates a vacuum of excellence. Okay, We've got these other things filling, filling the inside of us, and when they're gone, we're like, uh, what am I supposed to be living for if I can't stream Netflix 30 hours a week? What am I, what am I living for? We must remember what our goal is, to please our Creator, to find joy in Christ. And this moves us to follow Him. This moves us to remember what we should be living for. That's how Paul was able to say, find joy from a prison. It was because he knew what his goal was. He knew that his goal was to be written in the book of life. He says, these friends that I've worked with, these people I've worked with, their names are in the book of life. My name's in the book of life. I want you to be there as well. But you've got to remember this regularly. The world gets us down. The trials, the tribulations, the difficulties that we face, that we wake to every morning, and that we wish were not there. They weigh us down and they burden us. We've got to remember what we're living on this earth for. Paul reminds Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. As we have our classes, as we worship, as we have our devotionals, this should be the goal of our instruction. And when someone leaves here, they should leave hopefully with a purer heart, with a better conscience. Perhaps they came forward, they asked for forgiveness, they asked for prayers. But when they leave here remembering their goal, remember the other points, remembering the things that they've studied, this should be what comes out of the instruction here so that people ultimately know that their name is written in the book of life. Verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let others see your heart and soul. Let others see the joy that is in your life. This is finally how we strive to be an excellent Christian. The question is, do you rejoice in your Christian life? Compare yourself to Paul. Many of us have been through difficult times over the last couple of years, even in recent months. And it can be difficult to find joy in those times. And I'm not saying Paul woke up every morning you know, with a big old smile on his face between the poor food that he probably got, if he got any, and the sores that the chains rubbed on his arm, I'm sure at some points he didn't feel that great. But he felt good on the inside. He felt good with his inner peace, knowing and remembering his Savior, knowing and remembering what he was put on this earth to do, to bring others to Christ. And while it might have been difficult for him to sing, 
in prison, we know that he showed the guards something different, something that they'd never seen before. Because through his other experiences, being jailed and so forth, he was able to bring people to Christ because that he was able to show them that he was rejoicing, whatever that might have looked like. We should pray that we have joy and that others will see it. That's my hope, and it's, it's difficult sometimes for people to see the joy that you have. Well, you just, you're just a Bible thumper, Dale. You know, you might get some things like that. But for others to see your joy and how Christ makes a difference in your life, that is the greatest testament to your Christian life, the greatest testament to our Savior, that you live for Him every day, and that indeed it does make a difference in your life. Verse 5, let your forbearance, one translation reads, let your moderation, the NIV reads, I believe forbearance is in the King James Version, let your gentleness, let your gentle spirit, the New American Standard, be known to all men. We must exhibit these qualities, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes we miss the mark on all these other things. Sometimes we're not excellent Christians. Sometimes we fall short. Paul even said that. He, he's, he's confessed that himself to us in Romans chapter 7. Sometimes I know the right thing to do, and I still don't do it. So excellent here is, is, is not a perfect Christian, but excellence here as I'm, as I'm speaking to you this morning is better than you once were. Moving forward because you're looking behind because you're thanking our Heavenly Father because you want other people to see how you can rejoice even in spite of all that is wrong in the world. Because quite often we are angry and boastful. We're prideful. We go in directions that we know we shouldn't and we struggle and we struggle to get out of bed every day and we wonder what am I doing it all for? Well, we're doing it to have our name written in that book of life and to show others that in a dark, lost, and dying world, that it is possible. And thankfully, we have one who shows us a better way, one who teaches us to be gentle, one who was beaten and hung on a cross, and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That level of love we may never reach, but certainly we are definitely striving for it. And looking to that example... We get mad at the girl in the checkout line. We get mad because we got to check it out ourselves. We get mad in the drive through line, unless it's Chick fil A, because boy, they rip you right through. But we get mad in all these sorts of situations. And we can't be perfect, but we can be better. So I hope this morning you'll take these lessons from Paul writing to the Philippian church and see that you can be an excellent Christian. Now, in verse 5. There's four more words. The Lord is near. We don't know when He'll come back, when He'll be that close, but we know that He's near to us all. And whenever you have that relationship, it makes a huge difference in your life, and you can be an excellent Christian, but perhaps the Lord is not near you. Perhaps you're not a Christian. Perhaps you are a Christian and have fallen away. In either case, Come forward, let us assist you, let us baptize you into the body of Christ, into the Lord's church as was instructed all throughout the New Testament. And you can start this morning being that excellent Christian. Won't you do so now if you need to? As we stand and sing, we encourage you.